This is Travion Williams. Last season, he was a first team all Big Ten selection. You can make a strong argument that he's the best passing big man in the country. He also has fantastic touch and footwork around the basket, and he can even handle the ball out on the perimeter with a great crossover for someone his size. All of that is why CBS Sports ranked Williams as the number six player in all of college basketball during the preseason right in between Chet Holmgren and Max Aismas. And yet, despite all of that, for the first 10 games of the season, Williams came off the bench for Purdue. Which leads me to this guy, Zach Eady, the Purdue player that was unexpectedly starting over Williams. At seven foot four, 295 pounds, Eady is one of a kind in college basketball. And as a result, the sophomore from Toronto has been the most dominant offensive player in the country on a per minute basis. He's second in the NCAA in points per 40 minutes while shooting a ridiculous 72% from the floor. And perhaps most importantly, it's translating to team success. The Purdue offense is number one in points per possession by a comfortable margin. Edie's combination of size and coordination makes him a nightmare for opponents to scout against and defend. And while he's not exactly a track star in the open court, he moves reasonably well for his size. Watch how he's nearly out of the picture as this shot is released, but then just sheds the box out, grabs the rebound, and finishes under control with his left hand. In this video, I'll take you through the entire Zach Eady experience, the X's and O's that coach Matt Painter uses for Eady within Purdue's offense, and the key statistics that show what makes him so unique. Please remember to hit those like and subscribe buttons to help out the channel. A big thank you to Huddle for again sponsoring this video. The stats you'll see later were charted using Huddle Sportscope. And thank you guys so much for all the support and kind comments on my last video. It's getting pretty close to a million views, and I really appreciate you watching the channel. There's been a handful of giant players in college basketball over the past 15 years, but no one bigger than UNC Asheville's Kenny George. He's tall, and then there's Kenny George tall, actual size. Sort of like there's Rich and then there's Bill Gates Rich. The UNC Asheville Center stands 7 feet 7 inches tall, 7'9", in one of his 12 pair of custom-made Nikes. The only shoes he owns because nobody else makes a size 28. He's also 360 pounds, which means opposing teams need to be afraid of both heights and widths. George played two seasons at Asheville before his career was derailed by injury. And although he did make national headlines when Tyler Hansborough dunked on him, George had a very good sophomore season, earning second team all Big South honors and winning the conference's Defensive Player of the Year award. His no jump dunks made him look like a rig creative player in a video game. A few years later, Sim Bular landed at New Mexico State. He was listed at 7 foot 5, 360 pounds and helped the Aggies reach the NCAA tournament in both of his seasons in Las Cruces. Bular won the WAC Tournament Most Outstanding Player Award in both of those years. Next on the scene was the 7 foot 6 Mamadou Enja. He played three seasons at UC Irvine and nearly helped the Anteaters pull off a March Madness upset over the four seeded Louisville Cardinals. Enjai put on a dunk show in that game, but his team couldn't quite get the victory, falling 57 to 55. In Enjai's final season, he ran into some freshman by the name of Taco Fall playing in just his second ever collegiate game. Fall, who was also listed at 7'6", blocked Enjai twice in the opening minutes of that game. The game would eventually go to overtime with Irvine winning by a point. Three seasons later, Taco would end his career at Central Florida with a round of 32 matchup against Zion Williamson and Duke. Taco's size gave the Blue Devils all they could handle. He had 15 points, 6 rebounds, and 3 blocks. But with 15 seconds left, Zion went right at him, fouling Taco out and converting a huge end one. Duke then went on to advance to the Sweet 16 by just a point. And finally, this season, there's a new big man in town in 7'5", Jamarion Sharp. Listed at just 235 pounds, Sharp is much leaner than his peers, and he's not currently much of a post-up threat for Western Kentucky. But he's the most mobile big on the list and has excelled as a roller to the rim and as a shot blocker. Sharp currently leads the entire country in block percentage, blocking 20% of all shots attempted when he's on the court. 
So now if we compare all of those players I just listed to Zach Eady so far this season, the numbers aren't particularly close. Eady is averaging nearly 33 points and 17 rebounds per 40 minutes. Those are both easily the highest of any of the bigs in his height range. As you might expect from players with so much size, they tend to draw a lot of fouls. But Edie's in his own category there too, drawing over seven fouls per 40 minutes. A good chunk of those are fouls on the floor, with his defender desperately trying to push him away from the hoop before he catches the ball. Against North Carolina, both of the Tar Heels starting big men, Armando Baycott and Dawson Garcia, fouled out versus Purdue. And Brady Manick also had four fouls off the bench. It's hard to stay out of foul trouble when guarding Edie. On top of that, Edie is the only big guy on the list who's an above average free throw shooter. The NCAA average this season is 71%. Edie is currently at 72.5. But box score stats don't quite tell Edie's whole story. So let's do some charting. Matt Painter has chosen not to have Edie and Williams on the court together this season. They both strictly play the five. But even though the two of them play the same position on the same team, they have very different playing styles. To show that difference, we used Huddle Sports Code to chart all 67 of Edie's made baskets and all 66 of Williams's. The table shows how many dribbles each player took before making those shots. Edie is averaging just 0.25 dribbles per shot. 78% of his baskets have come off of zero dribbles, and he hasn't taken more than two dribbles before making a shot all season long. On the other hand, Williams averages 1.44 dribbles per shot. His most common amount of dribbles before shooting is two. So you can clearly see a difference between Williams and Edie, but I think there's an even better way to show it. This looks like a shot chart, but it's actually a catch chart. Each dot indicates the location where Williams first caught the ball prior to making his move and taking a shot. As you can see, there are dots all over the court. Purdue even uses Williams out on the perimeter, letting him attack slower defenders off the bounce. Edie's catch chart is very different. Essentially, everything comes in or around the paint. When Edie's on the court, Purdue is relentless in creating deep post position for him. There is that one dot where he was throwing the ball above the elbow, but it was actually kind of an accident. With a minute left in the Villanova game, they tried to get the ball to Edie at the elbow. He managed to grab the loose ball and went from this to a powerful dunk in just one dribble. Not a bad recovery, footwork, and finish for a guy that's nearly 300 pounds. But how does Purdue and Edie create all those other dots that are right near and around the basket? The answer to that question is the post pin. This is Purdue's first possession of the game against Florida State. FSU is using their up-the-line defense, where off-ball defenders play in between their man and the ball instead of their man in the basket. Purdue knows that the Seminoles are going to front the post, so all they do is clear out Jaden Ivey to distract the help defender, have Edie pin his man, and then lob the ball over the top of the front for a dunk. Later in the half, Purdue had another play for an Edie post pin. It started with a flare screen towards the weak side. As that was happening, Edie set a screen and then ducked in against the front. Because of that initial flare screen, the weak side defender is late to help, and it's another dunk. Here's that same exact play, but this time Ivy drives baseline towards that post pin. Because the defense is battling with Edie, the help is again late, with Purdue reversing the ball around the horn for an eventual jumper. That's a concept that happens a lot thanks to Edie. On a baseline drive, this would normally be Malik Osborne's help, but he's busy battling it out with Edie. Matthew Cleveland is the next help defender that has to step up, but it's too long of a distance for him to catch up to Ivy. These are examples of Edie's size and physicality freeing up not just easy baskets for himself, but also for his teammates. In the second half, Purdue went back to that same play we saw earlier. This time, Florida State's weak side help was there early, but all that did was then open up the skip pass three to Sasha Stefanovic. Same thing on this play. Villanova switches the screen, so Edie goes to post up. With Jermaine Samuels giving weak side help, he's forced into a long closeout, which Caleb first converts into an N1. It's a pick your poison situation for the defense. You can't get away with fronting Edie without giving weak side help. He's just too big. 
but Purdue is shooting over 40% from three. So the more you give help, the harder it becomes to stay with those shooters. The other issue is that even if the weak side defender is in help position, there's a good chance that he's a guard. And a six foot three or six foot four helper doesn't stand that much of a chance against Edie regardless. He'll just finish over you anyways. Playing behind the post instead of fronting comes with its own challenges. Here Edie starts his post up a step outside the paint, but by the time he actually catches the ball, he already has a foot in the paint. Same thing here. He's up near the elbow to start, but uses his strength to get all the way down into the restricted area. When Edie puts the ball on the floor, his go-to post move is the drop step. He's equally comfortable turning over either shoulder and finishing with either his right or left hand. So with all that in mind, the set play Purdue uses the most for Edie is actually pretty simple. The Boilermakers start in a box with two at the elbows and two on the blocks. These two players overload out to Edie's side. Then Edie ducks in Baycott for the easy basket. This time Edie starts out on the other block and then moves over to create an angle for the passer, dragging Baycott with him and finishing with the left hand. But Purdue also uses misdirection within this set. Stefanovic acts like he's going to overload, but then turns around. And the same thing with Williams. He fakes like he's going to the left block, but then turns right back around to the right. With Samuels out of position, it's an easy bucket. It's a pretty simple play, but the defense can't afford any indecisiveness or missteps against Edie. If he's able to create an angle by pinning his man in, it's a basket. Matt Painter runs multiple different lob plays for his big men, like the one you're seeing right now. But to truly appreciate them, we have to start with Purdue's regular offense. The Boilermakers run a set where the point guard sets a screen for Edie to come up to the foul line area. Then they initiate zoom action, usually for Stefanovic. Here he uses the zoom to find Edie on the roll. And here's another example of the play, but this time Stefanovic keeps it himself off of the zoom and gets to the hoop. So now that we've seen that, this lob play starts to make more sense. Again, the point guard sets a screen for Edie. Bryce Golden is probably expecting Edie to pop out for the zoom, but he gets juked for the alley-oop. The lob is disguised to look like Purdue's normal offense, but then surprise the defense at the last second. Purdue went to the play in the final minutes against Villanova. With both Nova defenders sucked in on the ED lob, Isaiah Thompson was open for the dagger three. Here's another play Purdue runs. It starts with a weave, then Ivy comes down and sets a cross screen to get ED a post touch. Again, the Boilermakers have a counter that involves a lob. Instead of using that cross screen, ED can reject it and just go straight to the rim for a dunk. By having these counters, it prevents the defense from cheating the play. Out of that same weave set, Matt Painter has several different options. Here it's Williams coming off of the cross screen, and he turns around to set a screen of his own for Brandon Newman. And on this one, it looks like Ivy is going to set the cross screen like normal, but instead, Edie sets one for Ivy, leading to another three. It's this combination of both high-level talent and high-level set execution that makes Purdue's offense so elite. The same goes for Zach Eady. Obviously, it's hard to stop a 7'4 big that has Eady's coordination no matter what. But Purdue maximizes Eady by relentlessly creating him deep post position. And having Travion Williams as a 1-2 punch certainly helps Eady as well. Just as you start to get used to Eady banging inside with his power game, Williams checks in and starts crossing you up off the bounce. Some games are better fits for Williams, some some games are better fits for Edie. It also allows Purdue to limit Edie's minutes. If he was playing 35 minutes a game, his per minute stats would almost certainly take a hit. But as it stands now, in his current role with the Boilermakers, Edie is the most dominant offensive player in college basketball. Thank you very much for watching. One more reminder to please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Huddle is the sponsor of this video. I created the dashboard you saw earlier using Huddle Sports Code. By using Huddle, it allows me to link all of my data and graphics to actual video. So for example, let's say I go to my dashboard and click on the two times where Edie dribbled the ball twice. By clicking that number, that automatically pops up those two possessions. They both came in the game against Rutgers, which happens to be Purdue's only loss of the season thanks to Ron Harper's buzzer beat. I can even click on the bars in the graph on the right to watch the video as well. It's this combination of both video and statistics which makes Huddle Sports Code so great. If you're a coach or a content creator interested in learning more about Huddle's products, there's a link in the description. Hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next one.